welcome again, <laughs> just for everyone who's joining on a, um, after this the webinar, so they might be able to to share as well. Um, my name is Olka Vega. I'm the Executive for Economic and Environmental Justice with the United Women in Faith National. Um, and today we'll be introducing ourselves and our speakers and we'll be uh, exploring um, more on the intersections of the nexus of food, agriculture and justice. And we're gonna get us started with uh, some poll questions. So um, Marianne, if you can help me launching the poll, um, just some general questions to know who is with us today. Uh, if you're a member of United Women in Faith, we would like to know. Um, and what is, if you are um, affiliated, what is your um, United Women in Faith jurisdiction? Um, and also we would like to know if this is your first time attending one of our webinars. Um, we wanna do a shout out to our new uh, uh, members that are joining us or, or folks that are um, just hearing of the webinar for the first time, welcome. Um, and because we're on the topic of food and justice, um, we would like to share our poll question on um, what food relates to. Um, and uh, if you can see it right there, or I can share it as well. There we go. Um, so we have a few options, faith, community and family, justice and equity, energy. Feel free to include all of those options that apply. Um, what is speaking to you today? Uh, what do you think is relevant? What we're here for? Um, any of those that apply. Let me know if uh, folks are able to join. If you're all seeing it on the screen, is it up for you? Is it working now? Wonderful. Where's the poll supposed to be? You can select all of them. That's a great part. If you can't choose, if you're like, it's it's all good options, you can uh, select multiple choice. We're, we're only getting your screen. We're not seeing a poll that we can click on. No, we're all we can see is a slide. That's it. Okay. Is nothing popping up separately on the side? Nope, just your picture. Hmm. You know what? I'll try it one more time. You know, I can see it. I, I, I see, see all of you. Poll. Yeah. I see everybody. Yes, we can see everybody, but there's not a poll pop up where we can click on stuff. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes there, there it is. Button. Let me relaunch it, maybe. Okay, I just did that again. Did that work now? I yes. still don't have a pop up poll. Okay. I don't either. Oh, no, I don't see it. Maybe, um, I don't know if you have a polling question uh, option at the bottom of the screen. And thank you for letting us know that is, if it's not working, because that's. There is no it. option at the bottom to pop for a pop up poll. Yeah, just, I have, have to stop sharing to put the poll up. Let me try that. No, no, we see you. I see you. Not I was able to click on polls. It was an option at the bottom of my screen, uh, just a few steps right of the video screen, and a poll did pop up. So I am able to complete the poll. I can get poll. Yes, I saw the oh, poll oh. submitted. Oh, and it's asking me to launch it, Elka. <laughs> yeah, Marion, do you know what you're I, you don't, I haven't had this um, before. I'm just going to try it one, one more time. We'll end this poll and then I'll relaunch it again. And then if not, I think maybe we can put the poll questions up and we can share in the chat. Yeah, that sounds good. Oh, I see some of the options. Okay, great. A few folks have been able to answer. Thank you. It might be our technology on this side. So I apologize and thank you all for Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Okay. I've got it finally. Wonderful. Thank you. And also feel free for those who are new, feel free to write in the chat if it's this is your first uh, Just Energy for All webinar. Welcome. We're very excited that you're here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, reshare my screen in the time being. Um, and but, but please continue filling in um, the poll questions. Um, and also, as we're doing the questions and, and continually to fill in, um, we can introduce ourselves as well in the chat. Uh, just remember to write your name, where you're calling us from, um, who the original indigenous people of the land where you are. So um, me, I'm currently in New York, um, and the original peoples here are the Munse, uh, Lenape, the Shakti Koke, and the Wapinga um, here in, in the Manhattan 
um, Island, uh, my affiliation with the United Women of Faith, the Executive for Economic and Environmental Justice, pronouns uh, she and they. And feel free to uh, pop those in the chat. Thank you for, for those who have already doing that. And I see we have folks from uh, Hawaii, uh, California, Kentucky, wonderful, Northern Great. Illinois. North Carolina. Welcome, welcome. Great, so just a quick reminder as well of our sisterhood um, of grace to be here present, uh, uh, listen actively with our heads and our hearts. Um, we're gonna speak from our own experience, also be aware of our body language, um, respect confidentiality about what has been shared in this space, um, own our intentions and our impact, um, what we say matters in this space and also to others. And we're gonna practice sustainability um, and um, expect um, unfinished business uh, with both discomfort and joy, right? If we're doing the work of justice, we have to be prepared to be challenged sometimes um, and to challenge what we know and what we're doing to try to do better, right? And, and try to do God's work into action. So thank you all for um, following our Sisterhood of Grades guidelines. Um, and now with that being said, I would like to um, invite us for an opening prayer. I don't know if uh, Joanne has been able to join us in the chat. If not, we might um, ask uh, Marianne or another if we can have a volunteer to um, open us in prayer today. I don't think Joanne's able to join us yet, Olga, um, but I'm happy to share a prayer for my daily prayer guide if you'd like. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Marian. I appreciate it. Um, thank you. Well, this comes from our uh, midweek prayer from our daily prayer guide. Would you all pray with me? Creator God, our hearts and souls cry out to you. Pour out your spirit upon your people. Embolden us to live radically, live peacefully, and worship joyfully. Amen. And it comes from David McCormack, who's a mission advocate in the South Central jurisdiction. Thank you so much, Marianne. So a quick um, overview of our agenda for today. Um, so we'll be doing um, some spiritual grounding as we're addressing this topic um, of food and justice um, and the intersections um, in agriculture and energy. Um, we're gonna we um, have some great speakers today. So first we have uh, Linda, one of our members, Linda Osikowitz uh, from United Women in Faith in Northern Illinois. Join us. Uh, we have a good colleague also from um, Climate Action U.S. Climate Action Network, uh, Karen uh, Vigilo, that I've had the pleasure to uh, connect with already a, a few times, and Dr. Jennifer Taylor. Um, uh, she will be presenting to us to enable all human beings, um, and she's in Florida and has been very meaningful in advancing um, just agricultural uh, practices um, in the state. Uh, and then we'll have finally some Q&A um, to be ready to use our minds and engage to prepare some really good questions for our speakers today. Uh, and then we'll take some next steps uh, into how can we apply what we've learned and put it into action um, and also get some general um, updates um, about what we can do nationally uh, with some campaigns that we have. And then we'll have um, closing prayer by Janine. Um, so for um, our spiritual grounding and a little bit more of introduction to this work, you know, it, we've, we've discussed the work of there were many different ways that we could approach, you know, the topic of food and agriculture and energy. They're very big and broad topics, and they're they're they can be difficult topics. But then it's there are also topics that, whether we are conscious of it or not, they're very present in our everyday lives and our food choices and the space that we share with our family and our communities. You know, sharing of the bread is such an intimate practice. And so we wanted to explore this nexus of food, agriculture, and energy um, through a justice perspective. And not only a justice perspective, but a justice perspective that is informed by our faith, but in also the realities of our world, right? Um, as United Women in Faith and our backgrounds, um, how are we putting our, our faith in, in, in love into action is through one of those lenses. And there's many connections in which food and agriculture and energy for just energy for all campaign um, connect. And so we're very um, 
excited to explore those together and more institutionally thinking. Um, I wanted to share a little bit of our book of discipline and what that had to do uh, with food justice. And there's um, under resolution uh, 160, there's a few notes on related to food. And so one includes the management or of water resources, uh, land, um, and, and management as well of um, waste and, and other resources that connect to food. Then we also have a section on food security and also one on food justice more specifically. Um, and part of what they say um, is that um, we have to support policies that increase access to quality of food, particularly those that have the fewest uh, resources. And so um, we also affirm local sustainable um, small scale small scale agricultural opportunities that allow communities to feed themselves because um, food justice is very at the core, right? And then it's, it's about communities being able to feed uh, themselves and getting access to food, but then it's also being conscious of the labor that produces there, right? And so also um, making sure that we're um, fighting for labor justice and, and, and supporting farm workers that are involved um, in, in the work. Um, so it's important areas. So if you want to go into more of the specifics, the 160 also touches, um, resolution also touches on um, denouncing the use um, of certain chemicals and pesticides that make food insecure and also are dangerous for the farmers uh, that, that produce it and, and everyone in the, in, in the practice. Um, but then he gives a little bit more detail. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, look it up um, on, on, in the Book of Discipline and Resolution 60. And with that um, being said, I also uh, took advantage of my time here in New York and I found uh, this little book that I have with me, Food and Faith. And I just wanted to share a little bit of it um, for this time together today. And one part that caught my attention um, spoke on business and food. And that really spoke to me here because I haven't done any cooking while I'm here in New York. <laughs> I've just been eating um, because there's not a lot of time for doing that at the moment because there's busyness of life. Um, and so I've just been getting a lot of food to go and things like that. And I was like, well, this is this feels really very relevant. And um, on page 30, it reads, um, Today, more than ever, Americans are busy. We are busy with work, errands, email, driving, and shopping. The average American spends 72 minutes, minutes driving daily, um, and a typical business executive loses 68 hours a year on hold on, um, on, hold on the telephone. Add to this list sports, music, homework, karate, or any other activities that your children or gran a grandchildren may be involved in, and you have a very busy American family. Then it says, this kind of schedule often leads to people making food choices based on expediency and convenience, hence why I thought it was relevant. Fast food is regularly the meal for the family on the go. Then it says, invites us to read, when was the last, think of the last time that you, that you ate? Was it lunch probably? Did you taste the food that you ate? Did you recognize the food did more than refuel you? Did you thank God for nourishment that is available to you only because of God's creation? Did the meal remind you of your reliance on God for all things. And then it says, did it even occur to you to ask yourself any of these questions? And I would like to add, did it occur to us to think of the labor and the hands that produced and transported the food all the way to where we found it. We often complain that our busy schedules are a mixture of exasperation and pride. Busyness is a result of the center, center point of our culture, achievement. In America, the preferred worldview is that doing is most sensible since it leads to achievement. 
But instead, now with our daily lives, instead of following the ancient way to celebrate our relationship with God through food that has been consecrated by Jesus in the ultimate memory device, do this in remembrance of me. Now eating has become an activity of refueling to support our busy schedules, like filling the gas tank on the car. It is a necessary activity. In our busy lives, it takes some conscious refocusing to make eating a moment of praise, thanks, and recommitment to our Christian faith. And I will add and think of the systems that make it available to us and ask ourselves, are they just? So with that being said, um, I would like to invite uh, Linda um, to share with us. Um, you can see the beautiful photos of, of her garden. And she has some on the background as well. And we were, Marion and I were just so excited when we saw those photos, like we were thinking a small little garden. This is like a huge garden. Um, and Linda, um, she's one of our social action coordinators for United Women in Faith in Northern Illinois Conference. Uh, she lives in Deer Park, Illinois, uh, Northwest outside of Chicago. And she attends Barrington United Methodist Church. Uh, which she spends about half of her week uh, volunteering in the church community garden. So Linda, thank you so much and welcome. Thank you. Um, I, it is not my garden, it's my church garden. <laughs> I just wanna make sure everybody understands that. Um, I live near the village of Barrington, Illinois, which is a suburb about 40 miles Northwest of Chicago, sort of a country suburban area. And when our downtown church was destroyed by a fire in 1998, we moved a few miles south to the village of Barrington Hills and our church now sits on several acres. After a few years of being in our new building, it was suggested that some of the land become a garden. I'm guessing this is probably around 2010 or 2011. One of our members, Lou, who is now in his mid eighties had taught horticulture and with his help and a couple of dedicated volunteers, our congregational garden was begun. I'm told it is now about one and a half, but I think it's closer to two acres. It includes seven garden plots, which are watered with a drip irrigation system that was installed a few years after the garden was begun. This past year, 4,000 plants were planted, tomatoes, broccoli, cucumbers, four kinds of peppers, zucchini, yellow, acorn, butternut, and spaghetti squashes and pumpkin seeds are also planted for the preschoolers. Some of Lou's former students own a greenhouse and they have given us the space to begin growing the plants. Um, since COVID, they have planted the seeds and nurtured them for us. Previous to COVID, uh, church volunteers would go to their space and plant the seeds. Funds come from various sources. Our church's mission budget helped in the early years now individual donations, donations from special groups and outside donors help with the annual expenses of anywhere from $2,500 to $4,000. Around 25 volunteers or 25 individuals volunteered this past year with a core of about 15 to 18 volunteers. Tasks include um, rototilling early in the spring and setting up the irrigation system both of those are done by a couple of specialized volunteers. And then the rest of us get together to transplant the plants in late May and early June. We place tomato cages over 1500 tomato plants. Um, and then we weed and we weed and we weed and we keep weeding until harvesting and actually through harvesting, which begins in late July and early September and ends in September. Um, some of the tasks, like I said, are handled by just a few volunteers, but anyone can be taught to weed. Most of the volunteers are actually senior citizens. I'm one of the younger ones, and not all of them are from our congregation. We tried to involve a few high school students this year, which met with a little bit of success. 
Uh, one of the things I enjoy and think is so cute is our, our church has a preschool. And in the fall, the little preschoolers at ages two, three, four, and five put on their um, galoshes and come out and walk around with Papa Lou who shows them all around and they get to pick tomatoes. And when the pumpkins are ready, they get to walk out into our own little pumpkin patch. This past year, 20,800 pounds, which is over 10 tons of vegetables were provided to nine food pantries and uh, to our monthly church community meal. Uh, they've dug up the records. Uh, they were able to find records for the past 11 years. And those records show that nearly 250,000 pounds of produce has been raised since about uh, 2011. All of the vegetables are donated and the pantries have expressed much appreciation as fresh produce was especially hard to access this summer. Um, like all food pantries, um, they, the clients who are served are families or individuals who need to supplement their food supply on an emergency basis, perhaps because of loss of jobs, illness or other difficulties. They might be lower income citizens like senior citizens on a low fixed budget or single parents who cannot work because of small children at home and others are affected by seasonal layoffs. The very first pantry that we delivered produce or that produce was given to was one that our church had been in partnership with for several years, taking them monthly donations people brought in from the grocery store. But as the garden grew and there was more produce than they could use, additional pantries were added as we learned of them. And then the people in charge would go and visit them and explain our story. And so um, we are now up to nine various food pantries. Adding to the pantry has also made us aware of how big the need is for fresh vegetables for folks who don't have the resources to buy them. Sometimes we deliver to food pantries, but most of the times the pantries have a driver who come to us. And sometimes if I'm up there when they come, it's humbling. Those drivers thank us every time they come um, and express how thankful they are. But to me, it is just an honor to be able to help them. So we don't ever see the clients who receive our veggies, but we are so very thankful that we are able to provide them. I have only been involved in this project um, for three years. This is my third year and it has become my very favorite volunteer activity, but I can't quite explain to you why. Um, I go there not just because the food helps others, but there is something about being outside early in the morning. Um, the birds are chirping, unfortunately there's traffic, um, but it could be cold and it could be hot and there's mosquitoes, but there is something about walking into a muddy field, and I do mean muddy, and coming out with a cucumber or a squash, it, it's just, something I can't describe. I've decided to finally call it a connection to the creator and the creation and the ability to provide a need to others. And um, it's hard to explain, but um, it is something that I love and it, it draws me there uh, three or four days a week. Um, real quick, if I have time, I do wanna mention that I have learned there are three other church gardens in our Northern Illinois Conference. One um, in a Chicago suburb focuses on providing immigrants and refugees who have settled here through the World Relief Program an opportunity to raise their own fresh produce so they can have something from their home country. A church in Rockford partnered with a school district to uh, plant a bed at public housing and children were involved in growing that. And a third church more closely to the Chicago area um, shares their produce with their community residents and their church's food ministry program. So that's my garden. That's beautiful. Thank you so much, Linda. And thank you for sharing those uh, other resources as well. So if anyone's joining us from Chicago, now they have a few options that they can join. So <laughs> Linda has just volunteered us all. And <laughs> we're also volunteers in a community garden. I have volunteered in my college community garden at some point. Feel free to include that on the chat. We would like to know who is also volunteering in this beautiful practice and how impactful and how uh, beautiful to see that connection uh, the U.S. have built through the garden and Wow, 10, 000, 10 tons 
uh, per year. That's very impressive. That's that's incredible. Um, and I can see it takes a lot of hands. How many volunteers do you say you all have? Um, there, I forget what did what did he tell me? Um, like it, it's lower this year. There were twenty five on the list. There's a core of, of fifteen to maybe eighteen. Um, there are two or well, three gentlemen who lead it up, and one of them is Lou, who is well into his eighties, um, probably closer to ninety, who comes every morning and walks around to check it out. And then there's two others who really keep it running and maintain contact with the food pantry. And then others just come as they're able to um, to pull weeds and to harvest. And I changed my screen. That that's one of the years when we had 3,000 tomato plants. We don't have that many tomato plants anymore because it was way too many. But um, that's uh, what a morning's produce looked like. Those are five gallon buckets and they weigh about 20, 25 pounds. Wow. Incredible. Thank you so much, Linda. I appreciate it. Um, and now uh, I'm just gonna move uh, on to our next speaker real quick. But if you have questions for Linda, uh, we'll keep a space for those at the end. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, Karen uh, Vigilo. Uh, she is a co-executive co director of Creation Justice Ministries with um, another dear friend, also Avery Lamb. Uh, she has um, served as a policy um, advisor and project management um, manager, as well as policy analyst and research analyst at Bread for the World. Uh, and she has been focusing on the intersections of climate change, uh, food security, and racial equity. Karen, we're so happy that you're here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, if you can stop sharing the screen and then I can pull up my presentation. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. So I'm so happy when I get the opportunity to come and speak around these issues of food systems and um, climate equity and just how all of this intersects and what it means for so many communities. Um, but before we get started, I want to talk about and define what is a food system. Food systems are complex webs of activities involving the production, processing, transport, and consumption of food obviously, um, but part of that um, process is very much about um, for the food system, it's, I guess to sum it up kind of plainly, it's everything that happens from the farm to the table to then what happens afterwards with how food is discarded. So to the waste bin or composting. And so all the steps that have to happen, the farming, the transportation, the processing, you know, if it's a product that's being made, it goes to grocery stores. There's so many steps that have to happen and it's um, a constant cycle that's going on. And so a food system is a very complex um, system that we have to deal with. And it's greatly um, impacted by climate change and it impacts climate change as well um, in turn. And so what is climate change? I highly doubt I need to define for you all um, what it is, but climate change is a long-term shift in global measures of climate, such as precipitation and temperature caused by human activities that increase greenhouse gas levels. Its many effects include rising sea levels and prolonged heat waves. And so as we're looking at this definition, it's you know very clear that when it comes to these issues um, and the global measures and the impacts of precipitation and temperature, all of these things have to deal with food. And how is it able to be grown? How are animals able to be um, raised for, you know, those who eat meat, but also just, you know, produce? It's, there's no part of the food system that is not changed or somehow interacts with the surrounding environment. And so what is climate justice? <laughs> as opposed to just saying climate change, climate justice is a practice that promotes equity by responding to the, har the harmful impacts of climate change in ways that center the challenges of historically marginalized groups. And so that is very much going through the process of looking at how is this impacting, especially humans, but especially those groups that have been historically marginalized. And so it's looking at, climate justice is looking at the impacts on, um, people based on race, 
people based on income levels, people based on gender. There's so many different impacts that happen. And part of the problem or conversation is that often we're not looking at those who have been historically marginalized as the face of the solution or the problem of climate issues, even though disproportionately um, so many are impacted. And so climate justice would really be doing solutions that will center these communities and not just include them in afterthought or sometimes not even include them at all or allow them to be sacrificed as a part of um, addressing climate change or the climate events that happen such as hurricanes and other things. Um, and so just to give this graphic for um, the foundations of racial equity, because part of the issue of addressing um, climate justice is that we have to look at it from an equity lens. And so again, this can be applied to different senses, but often when I'm talking about these things is very much centered around the issues of race. And so part of the challenge that we have looking at this graphic is that Often when we talk about issues, equality has been a part of the conversation for such a long time. And equality is very important and would never say that it's not important. However, as you see from the graphic um, on this slide, equality is something that is a bit of a challenge at times because it doesn't always necessarily mean that everyone gets their needs met. And so if you look at this graphic, you have this woman who um, is in a wheelchair and she's given the bike that everyone else has. She can't ride the bike. Um, you see a man who he has, again, the same bike as everyone else. Everyone in this graphic has the same bike and yet he's too big for the bike. Um, you have this woman in the graphic. It fits her just right, you know, kind of the Goldilocks effect. Um, um, but you have this young boy and he's too small for the bike. And so equality is giving everyone the same thing. Everyone has the same um, input and everyone, you know, gets the same thing. Equity is instead looking at how do we get equal outputs? And so that means everyone is getting something different as an input. Everyone is getting something different. But the results is that everyone gets what they need at the end. And that's where climate justice needs to live is the sense of equity, where we're making sure that communities um, and different marginalized, historically marginalized groups are always getting what they need based upon their circumstances and that we're not applying a one size fits all because we don't all live in the same, um, you know, realities um, in this country or the world for that matter. And so food systems and climate change, um, these are issues that intersect with each other. I'm sure many of you realize this already. Um, climate change and our food system, they have re a reciprocal relationship where they both impact each other and it just creates this cycle that keeps going on. And so um, just for a little statistic, agriculture, Sorry, my thing is blocking my agriculture, forestry, and other land use accounts for 24% of global greenhouse gas emissions, according to the US government. And so, because of that, this isn't a small issue. It's really big when we look at our food system then and how we manage land, how we manage the process of the food system it has a huge impact, almost a quarter of all the issues that are happening with food systems, but it also shows that then addressing the issues of how the food system and the climate change intersect, that there's a lot of potential then for, um, you know, reducing the issue as well, that making changes to our food system can have a huge impact um, for addressing climate change as well. Oh, sorry. Um, and so I want to just show some of the ways that food, the food system has an impact on climate change. Um, those ways that the food system impacts climate change is through the emission of greenhouse gases. As I talked about from the last slide, it's, it accounts for 24% in this country. Um, we also see it through food waste. Um, there's a lot of food waste that happens in this nation. And when that food is not properly discarded, it means that a lot of resources were wasted in its creation from water to soil to, you know, la human labor. All those things that were required went to waste. Um, um, but then also it emits greenhouse gases as it breaks down um, being in landfills. And so for that reason, um, you know, we really have to look at food waste as also another issue that needs to be addressed and how it contributes to our food system. 
Um, and about, as I was saying, um, 21 to 37% of total greenhouse gas emissions are attributed to the food system. And so that's a different source than the one that I mentioned previously that had it at 24% by the U.S. government. But many of the ways that the food system impacts climate change is through greenhouse gas emissions, as well as food waste um, being one of the ways that greenhouse gases um, gets emitted. And this also happens um, because of our food system. There's transportation that happens. We've had a lot of technological advances that have helped us to be able to address a lot of our food security needs, um, meaning that we're able to make food last longer. We're able to make sure that then more people have access to food, but it's come at a cost. And so you see a lot of waste happening from just how big our food system is, so much food gets transported from one part of the country to another and also during that time it's often refrigerated and so there's so much energy that happens just in the transportation of food that is required and so these are all things that have to be figured out in the future um, about how do we how do we continue to be able to um you know make enough food to supply not just our country but many different um industries in the world while at the same time not causing more damage to our earth um but climate change also impacts our food system and so this is where we see a lot of the um the experiences and it has so many impacts on so many communities and households climate change affects food security through higher temperatures, changing precipitation, lower, it can cause um, lower crop yields, um, and it can also be impacted by extreme events. And so when you have um, hurricanes, for example, go through Florida a few years ago, it had a huge impact on the supply of oranges that were available. And so you see during deep freezes, like in Texas, that impacts the farms. And so these things all happen. There have been so many floods over the last few years that have happened, maybe five years um, in the Midwest. And there's these floods that happen. There's some farmers that their land can't soak up the water fast enough that happens. So then when that happens, some of them just can't grow at all during that season. And so these are the types of things where these fast um, climate events are really, ha um, are really disrupting our ability to grow food and our ability to get food to communities as well in the transportation process. Um, another way that we see it impacted is that the supply side practices can contribute to climate change mitigation by reducing um, crop and livestock emissions. And so these are some of the things um, that can be done in order to try to reduce it. But it really is something where we know that um, like the, the growing of animals, for example, rearing of animals can also contribute to food systems and deforestation, which just exacerbates the issue. Um, and food security will increasingly be affected by future climate change events, unfortunately. We know that if we don't get a handle on this issue, then it will just make it harder and harder to be able to grow food and to get access to and get everyone access to food. And so our current food system feeds most of the world and supports the livelihoods of over 1 billion people. That's at a global scale. Um, but we also know that there's so many livelihoods that are connected to this. And so global crop and economic models project that one to 29% of cereal prices can increase by in 25 due to climate change. And so this is another way that we see um, that households are impacted. And so we have a hundred, uh, 1 billion people who are dependent upon the food system for their livelihoods. But we also know that not only those households will be impacted, but we know that as things become harder to grow, prices will rise. And so that will have an impact on those of us who are consumers of food, those of us who, you know, we may not always be on the land, but we get to reap the benefits of the land. And unfortunately, as these climate events keep happening and as temperatures continue to rise, it becomes harder to grow. And unfortunately, that does mean that it's going to have um, food prices will be impacted. And part of the challenges is that when that happens, that means that um, it will have a disproportionate impact 
on low income households um, and communities, it means that those who are not only low income, but already experiencing chronic health issues related to diet, such as diabetes, um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, whatever it is that can be impacted or managed with um, diet and exercise, they're already going to be more susceptible to more chronic health issues. And so this has um, not just the issue of related to like our ability to give food, but also like it's a public health issue. It's so many different sectors that are impacted and so many social justice issues are impacted when climate change has this level of impact on our food system. Um, it also means that there are people who they have land that may not be worth much in the future as temperatures continue to rise. And so there's a lot of issues that can happen in the future if we don't um, try to turn this, you know, this experience around with climate change, unfortunately. Um, an example of where we see a food process happening um, or food security and like an experience with climate change happening in New Bern, North Carolina, there was um, Hurricane Florence in 2018. And so this was an issue where there was Hurricane Florence made um, landfall in the Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina area um, as a category one storm. And when this happened, um, flooding from the rain was the main concern. 98% of residents lost power and early damage estimates were of $1 billion. Um, 30,000 people were impacted. The median household um, income was $41,000 between that and $63,000. And so this was not necessarily um, a low income community from the sense of being below the poverty line at large. Of course, there's people in the community who would be, but they're kind of just above it. So this is definitely a community that does not necessarily have the full resources needed to be able to recover quickly or to be able to escape from um, hurricanes, for example. And so the poverty rate is 19.1%. So almost a fifth of the population is considered to be in poverty. Um, and then you see the demographics of the people there. Um, and so what ended up happening is that there was an impact on food and how things, um, you know, the results of this climate shock, this hurricane, it had an impact on food and the community and how people had to respond. And so grocery store managers saw shift saw shifts clients and purchasing behavior immediately um, after the landfall happened. Um, there was a fluctuating demand, raised concerns about shocking, I'm sorry, stocking, um, food and the waste of food as well. Um, there were community partnerships that had to supply um, hot and cold meals. Um, but the loss of electricity definitely had an impact on food security during that time, as you especially have to worry about the refrigeration of so many foods. Um, and so the loss of electricity and the loss of cars made prepping and distributing meals challenging. And so often many people, so these communities had to kind of figure out how to do this in spite of the electric issues that they were experiencing. And so just to show like the power of our churches is that there was one church that ran an outreach operation for support as, you know, people were experiencing damage. Um, there was another church that had a mobile kitchen in order to be able to go around to communities. There was a religious organization from their national offer um, office that offered disaster supply boxes so that people had their basic needs met, um, you know, as a part of that, being able to give aid, whether it was from food or like, you know, first aid type of materials. And then you also had an organization that supplied 16,000 meals per day in the first week alone. And so we saw that there were so many people in the community that were able to come together and be able to um, give that support to people in this community. Um, however, that becomes harder when these events keep happening from year to year. Um, it often will displace communities. People eventually start moving. And so as this happens, these strong responses can happen, but over the years, the response and the ability to recover becomes slower and slower, um, unfortunately, because of the impacts of climate. 
And so what needs to happen? Next year is such an important year. Um, next year, we will see the 2023 Farm Bill um, be introduced, and it should be um, passed. That's not always the case that it happens in just a few months, though, um, so we'll see what happens. But the 2023 Farm Bill will be so important because it predicts the um, the the farm bill policy, it predicts the next five years. And so in response to our needs as best as we can predict um, for the next five years. And so part of the conversation that's happening is that we need farm policy that will be able to better have resilience and better able to respond to climate change. And so there's sustainability efforts that need to happen. There's issues around how do we have better land management? The USDA, um, United States Department of Agriculture, they have the biggest holding of land in this country in comparison to other um, thing, other agencies. And so it's not, you know, the other more environmentally oriented ones that manage the land, it's USDA. And so that means there's a lot of impact and power that can happen in this upcoming farm bill. The farm bill is also responsible for research that happens. And so not only are we talking about utilizing the best technology that we have, but also making the investments in the future technologies that can also help us in this situation. And then lastly, we also need to invest in strengthening food safety nets. And so we know that when climate um, events happen like hurricanes, earthquakes, wildfires, there are emergency assistance that can happen, but these programs can be strengthened um, in order to better give people more access to it to better respond to that real-time needs that they have. Um, but also there needs to be safety nets for farmers because again, when these events happen, if that's your livelihood, you need to be able to have some type of insurance or farmer farmer's insurance, not one that you have to pay for, but one that the government will give in order to make sure that your livelihood isn't messed up. Um, because unfortunately we're losing so many farmers because they don't have enough protection to be able to withstand so many of the challenges that they have in addition to the issues related to climate. And so um, there's a lot of things. The other thing that I forgot to put on this slide that needs to happen, there needs to be a conversation about what does climate reparations look like? because there's so many communities that have a more disproportionate impact um, when it comes to climate change. And these are also typically the communities that are most likely to be food insecure. And so there needs to be a conversation about how do we fix these issues in society? How do we make ourselves more resilient for future um, climate, current and future climate disasters that happen? And then how do we make sure that it doesn't happen again? And so climate reparations is an important conversation, not just related to food, but energy issues and different things that happen. Um, and so that is my presentation, um, but that's kind of my, my initial steps, but I'm happy to have more discussion or answer questions about, you know, what does that look like to really kind of go from where do we go from here type of you know conversation thank you so much caring i appreciate you and i appreciate your work and the connections that you've made for us and also some uh key things to um, be mindful of especially in legislation for um for next year um so thank you so much for sharing those that was very very meaningful um and and we'll make a space again for questions at the end and now i would like to introduce uh dr jennifer taylor um thank you so much for joining us uh, dr taylor uh, she's a certified organic farmer in georgia um where she and her husband grow organic fruits and vegetables um and she um, is uh, also associated with the florida agricultural and mechanical university um uh, she created and implemented the statewide small farm program, a, a sustainable development program that works to promote well-being, um, agroecology, organic farming systems, and benefits um, to underserved small farm communities and all communities in general. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Taylor, for joining us. And she's just an amazing human being. So we're very happy to have her uh, joining us as well. So the floor is all yours, Dr. Taylor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for sharing with the slide presentation as well. Thank you so much. Okay. So it's such an honor to, to be a part of the program today. 
and to hear the wonderful speakers um, and to share with them the approach and the work that they're doing. I thought we could maybe start with, I, I know all, all Bible is relevant to what we're speaking of today. Um, I found some texts in the Torah from chapter 60 of Isaiah that says, the Most High says, I will make your officers peace and your rulers righteousness. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither robbery nor destruction within your borders, and you shall call salvation your walls and your gates praise. Another translation that you might be more familiar with says, and I will appoint well-being as your government, prosperity as your officials. The cry violence shall no more be heard in your land, nor rack and ruin within your borders. And you shall name your walls victory and your gates renown. That's a great, great, great chapter. So I'm Jennifer Taylor. I am an agroecology organic farmer in the state of Georgia, in the great state of Georgia. So could you please go to the next slide? Aha. Uh -huh. So this is a photo of our farmland. My grandmother actually farmed this land, a beautiful piece of land uh, before me. Uh, she started out as a sharecropper and she was given an opportunity to buy land and she jumped at it. Can you believe it? She had a second grade education and she took advantage of this opportunity to save money throughout that period of time. And they had the money, she bought the land and she was able to move her state in life, so to speak, from that of being a sharecropper to uh, of a landowner, that of growing produce for others, you know, being on a sharecropper situation to that of producing and growing her own food for her own family and for her own community in the backwoods of rural Georgia. Next slide, please. Okay, right there, thanks. So today, oh, right there, that one, <laughs> thank you. Today we are the only certified organic farm in our county and in the surrounding counties. We use some of the same tools that my grandmother used and we grow some of the same crops that my grandmother grew. We are agroecology organic small farmers. Our farming practices include pathways that promote well being, that promote healthy soils, healthy foods, healthy environments, and healthy communities. Our agroecology organic farming strategies strengthen resilience, resilience thinking practices, and enable deliberate actions. We select varieties that can tolerate stress and that grow well in our sandy loam soils to enhance the sustainability and thrivability of our small farm. Our agroecology farm practices include using cover crops and crop rotations. You all know these practices, using mulches and earthworm composts and other kinds of composts and using raised beds and water conservation strategies and rain fed agriculture supporting pollinator habitats and beneficial insect habitats and seed saving and uplifting indigenous knowledge, establishing farmer to farmer networks and sharing of information. These kinds of knowledges and practice sharing uh, strategies are really important in uh, communities of socially disadvantaged farmers and underserved farming communities. So we establish workshops workshops and hands-on training opportunities uh, that provide an opportunity for not only underserved farmers to participate in and learn the benefits of agroecology farm strategies, but all farmers to do so as well on our small organic farm in rural Georgia. These are spaces where rural, poor, socially disadvantaged farmers, resource poor, socially disadvantaged farmers, small farmers, and all farmers can learn about agroecology, organic farming systems, and the benefits to their farm, to their food system, to their communities, but also to build hope 
and strengthen sustainability and resilient, safe, nutritious food supply for everyone. We believe that safe, clean, nutritious, healthy food, agroecology, organic food is a human right. On this slide, you will see also our use of cover crops. We grow cover crops all year round. This is hairy veg, barley, um, subterranean clover on the left. And then you see um, uh, millet and um, cowpea and uh, millet, cowpea, and another one I can't think of. Three, anyway, it's a variety of three cover crops on the right. Oh, uh, buckwheat, it's buckwheat, buckwheat, cowpea, and uh, millet on the right. That's generally grown in the summertime, you know, because it can take more of the stress of the, of the temperature. And on the bottom, you see the use of um, pine straw, our own harvested pine straw, certified organic pine straw, where we use it around uh, the crops to serve as a mulch to, to prevent uh, loss of moisture. And also it helps to decrease the impact of certain uh, insects. We use cover crops to manage weeds and increase soil moisture, soil organic matter and pollinator habitats and for all of the great benefits of cover crops. Next slide, please. That, that one, thank you. And here is a photo, a sample of uh, some of our organic produce that we grow. Uh, this is just a small sample, but these are muscadines, you know, the southern grape, and then ginger and turmeric and strawberries. Ne the next slide, please. Thank you. At Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, I am associate professor and I created our statewide small farm program. The statewide small farm program is an active participatory capacity building sustainable development program. It's holistic in nature. We're not just looking at the farmers as farmers, but we're looking at the, um, the life, the living, the livelihood, uh, a holistic view of the, of the person as well as the vocation. The program works with socially disadvantaged farmers, resource poor farmers, limited resource farmers, underserved small farm populations and their communities, farm workers and their communities to you identify needs and work together to develop relevant participatory mm -hmm. education, trainings, technical assistance in specific relevant areas because of sustainable development to bring about their own solutions for change and to encourage and enable well-being. A critical focus is agroecology and organic farming systems and these benefits that promote resilience and add protection and restoration to farmland and farm environments and communities. And these practices that promote healthy soils and healthy foods, the sustainable use of soil and water resources, and practices that support the use of traditional varieties, stress tolerant crops, seed saving and strategies that equip and enable resource poor farmers, underserved farmers, all farmers to recover, to recover in climate change or climate disruptions and to maintain and even increase yields for their families and communities that will enable farmer and farm sustainability and thriveability in, in adverse conditions and, and non-adverse conditions. The program also promotes agroecology, organic alternative market development, building sustainable nutritious food systems, healthy good food sovereignty for our communities. The statewide small farm program supports deliberate actions towards ensuring access, availability, and the benefits of safe, clean, healthy agroecology, organic food for all human beings and their environments. As a result of the hands-on capacity building sessions, we actually see changes in how farmers choose to grow their food we see changes as farmers choose to transition 
to agroecology. They recognize the benefits and well-being for their families, for their farm workers, for their farm environment, for their food and their food system. Next slide, please. Thank you. And we work with farmers and their communities to develop participatory alternative farmers markets. We see changes in farmers' ability to provide fresh, local, agroecology, organic produce and organic certified produce in their local marketplaces and positive changes in community support. These are agroecology organic farming system pathways that promote resilience, change, and well being. And you all would recognize that uh, during the uh, disruption with the uh, COVID um, and the aftermath, the, it was actually the small farmers, the local farmers, uh, that provided access of the produce in the communities because. Uh, uh, a lot of them do use agroecology methods and um, they were not connected, um, as well connected to the breakdown in the food distribution system. So they were the local resource of fresh uh, food during times of stress, health stress. Next uh, slide, please. We work with communities as network partners to develop community gardens and youth and adult learning experiences. This is not only teaching uh, and asking for youth participation, but this is uh, an alternative strategy that asks for youth participation and parent participation so that we're teaching um, parents and their children the benefits of organic farming systems, the benefits of agroecology. Uh, we are enhancing and enabling access and availability of healthy food choices and healthy food sovereignty options um, and uh, engaging in different types of uh, learning opportunities where it comes to uh, organic farming. So this is happening within underserved communities and within our Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities and all communities. Next slide, please. Okay, this was an opportunity that I had to participate in the Terra Madre Slow Food uh, um, event a couple of years ago, 2019. And it was such a great opportunity to talk with agroecology and organic farmers from across the world on a global basis as we work together to um, evaluate change and um, uh, build capacity and strengthen capacity and, and uh, work together to uh, make changes in the food system to impact the development of more accessible, healthy foods for all of us. Uh, next slide, please. And I serve as the ANOFO North America convener. Uh, in June of last year, we created um, and, and uh, a session, I guess you could call it a session with the ANOFO uh, headquarters as part of the 2021 United Nations Food System Summit Dialogue. And ANOFO, as you know, stands for the Intercontinental Network of Organic Farmer Organizations. Our ANOFO session brought together the voices of underserved farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers and their community organizations from across the nation. These small scale underserved farming community voices were not included at the table when decisions were being made. This ANOFO North America United Nations dialogue gave an opportunity for us as agroecology, organic farmers, to share our successes, benefits, our vision, and well being, and to give voice towards policy recommendations and pathways towards building a better future today and tomorrow. This was a great session, and it was such an awesome opportunity for uh, socially disadvantaged to participate and give their voice to the United Nations, believe it. But ANOFO North America session provided a space where our good intentions and well beings for our future generations were added to the international dialogue concept 
of the United Nations in the 2021 United Nations Food Systems Summit. Next slide, please. Thank you. So now this looks like a really intense slide with a lot of little words, but it's um, a, a flyer that we actually, an info flyer that we have used to talk about a national project, an ongoing national project, uh, a new project in uh, collaboration with the US Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Marketing Service. And it's a collaborative agreement also with Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University and the University of Maryland Eastern Shore. Uh, both of these are 1890 uh, land grant institutions, as you know. And what the uh, project does is it's uh, given um, support to historically underserved farmers and ranchers and fishers and agribusinesses uh, in acknowledging the, uh, ha the past um, hindrances and needs and lack of participation in um, USDA programs, and in particular, this USDA Agriculture Marketing Service Program. And so the project will work to identify needs and hindrances and evaluate barriers and challenges to the USDA AMS grant opportunities and others as they come up within the population, and, and especially as it pertains to socially disadvantaged farmers and their communities. And the project will co-develop with socially disadvantaged farmers and their organizations the deliberate actions to rectify inequalities in program access and success. Uh, this national project, we believe, is a great opportunity to engage deliberate participatory actions and relevant participatory change for underserved communities to remove hindrances and barriers and to ensure access and availability of clean, healthy, nutritious foods to all human beings and the opportunities to participate and gain access to programs that previously uh, most populations uh, seemingly had no knowledge of. The next uh, slide, please, thanks. Um, in June of this year, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University approved the funding of the Center for Agroecology. This is the first agroecology center that's located within the 1890 land grant system. And the name of our, our center is Lola Hampton Frank Pender Center. Lola Hampton is my grandmother. Can you believe the center is named after my grandmother and the work that she did to support her family as an uh, example of, uh, of the success and the hope and the transferal of freedom that small farmers have to their families. And Frank Pender, who is a well-known uh, agriculturalist and extensionist um, in the United States and um, around the world. So the center is named for these two individuals and the center focuses on strengthening socially disadvantaged farmers and their communities and all farming communities in agroecology specific organic farming practices and promotes the benefits of these strategies towards enabling well-being and building sustainable, resilient, healthy food systems and environments for all human beings. The Lola Hampton Frank Pender Center will also provide an agroecology academic program for students and as well hands-on learning experiences for our uh, local communities. The next slide, please. Thank you. So in closing, I suggest that these are pathways, these are our deliberate actions that demonstrate how we work within our communities and networks, university systems, government systems, and service on boards, on board memberships to promote agroecology organic farming systems, to engage, empower, equip, and build resilient, sustainable farming communities and healthy food sovereignty systems, and our deliberate actions to advocate for agroecology farmers, 
our resource poor small farmers and organic farming systems to enable change, participatory change in our local and national communities and change in our global communities to ensure access, availability, and the benefits of safe, clean, healthy, agroecology, organic food for all human beings and their environments. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. Um, that was very powerful. And thank you for sharing with us that lineage um, of work that has uh, transcended and is going through your family and, and continuing and connected to very important issues in, in those crucial um, communities. And so right now I want to open just a space. Uh, if you have questions uh, for Linda, for Karen, for Dr. Taylor, please feel free to share those in the chat or unmute yourselves and, and let's just have a conversation. Yeah, this is Ruth Bowen in Texas and I have a question for you, Ilka. Um, is there, uh, I know that the, there's a, some grants that the United Women of Faith uh, have for different organizations, different you know, individuals uh, throughout the world. Is there uh, a grant that within the United Women of Faith has that farmers, small farmers, uh, some of the, the ones that Dr. Taylor and that Karen described that need that kind of assistance to develop their farms? Does, the, does UW have grants that they can apply for? I don't know through other programs, um, through the Just Energy for All, we have also a couple of Pro, uh, programs and I haven't had the opportunity in my new role uh, to connect with them yet. But Marion, would you uh, be able to say in the top of your mind if any of the projects connects to it by any chance? Um, not, I, not off the top of my head, Olga. I could, um, I might, Liz might know, or I, I don't know if Liz is here, or she might know, but um, not off the top of my head right now. Sorry, Ruth. But that's that's an important uh, issue to share. So. As we're thinking of next year uh, grants and programming, if you're aware of small farmer initiatives uh, that we can support, do feel free to share those our way. Um, and they're small um, grants that we do have, but we're happy to make um, those available for those that eat and also connect people um, that they can follow up and volunteers. Because uh, normally we would want to have a member be actively involved with those projects um, so that we offer a little bit more support as well. Um, if possible. So thank you. Any other questions? I saw one um, on the chat earlier and I wanna bring it up um, while we're thinking of perhaps other questions. A couple of people mentioned, um, uh, you had a slide I think Karen with the different forms of racism and people kept asking about it. Um, can you tell us more about that? And then perhaps also, um, it, it was very beautiful the way you showed um, the food system options, there was a very nice visual, um, and you can give us some examples of also what those different forms of racism and, and power, um, forms of power oppression is, is present throughout uh, the, the food, product, um, uh, food system, so that we can have perhaps a few um, ideas of, of how that looks like and members can, can visualize that better. Yeah, so when it comes to racism, I mean, starting at the farm, um, Dr. Taylor can, I'm sure, speak about it better. Um, but from my own experience as a beekeeper, and then also from my experience um, with talking to Black farmers, um, there's so many issues of like making it hard for people to access land to grow their farms, but also to be able to keep their farms. There's um, laws around inheritance, heirs laws that systematically make it hard to um, keep and pass down um, land from generation to generation. And so there's those issues that happen. Um, but because of the racism that frankly has been happening for centuries, um, climate change just multiplies it. And so you already have communities that are impacted um, who struggle because of lack of economic opportunities to afford um, food, especially fresh food. You have people who live in food deserts, people who um, you know, just have challenges accessing fresh healthy foods when a storm happens because many of those communities have been disinvested um, for decades 
a storm comes through, flooding happens. You have communities that can't get to grocery stores for a week or longer sometimes because of flooding that takes away the one road that happened. And and you see in areas like um, certain parts of the bayous of Louisiana where it happens every year and yet nobody builds a bridge that's elevated. Um, instead, they just allow the, they just rebuild the same bridge or just wait for the flooding to subsist, uh, subside. And so um, those are the types of things that, you see constantly happening it's really just a multiplier of existing racial inequality it becomes challenging for people to afford food and when you see times like right now which isn't necessarily related to climate but just food prices are so high right now um, because of the supply chain climate change can have an impact in the supply chain um and so people who are already struggling to afford food then have even bigger challenges to afford food. Um, and then I think just more obvious examples of current day of like, look at what's happening in Puerto Rico. There's no way that not having access to electricity is not gonna have an impact on your ability to prepare food safely. Um, and, you know, we've seen that with Maria and other issues. And so unfortunately um, it happens, unfortunately from farm, to table, um, there's racism that's being experienced um, and it's having an impact on people's ability to put food on the table, to be able to have access to safe food and healthy food um, that will be able to, you know, nourish their families. Thank you so much, Karen. And I do, I did see a question also connected to that on the chat um, and that was addressed to Dr. Taylor. If you could give us a few examples of how um, small farmers are um, excluded. And then with that, I would like to tie it as well. A, a question for you, Dr. Taylor, um, also on what we've been seeing also that Karen just mentioned on the increased prices and increased challenges also connected to food with fuel prices, right? Um, have been seeing and what um, impact have you seen um, in, in, in the small farms and also what coping mechanisms or energy transitions or other forms um, um, of adaptation have you seen coming from small farmers given this current situation? So I guess two questions in one, how small farmers are included and how are they adapting? Okay, so uh, generally, um, I'm gonna make a distinction in small farmers. So here, here what I'm saying. Generally, uh, limited resource or resource poor farmers are not um, included in the, in the uh, are not readily included or have access to a lot of the same programs, even that small farmers, so-called small farmers have because of their lack of resources or because of, of how they are farming on, on the land and because of just the uh, historical racial, racial situation that exists, all of that compound, compounded. However, um, that, that does not mean that they are not able to produce. It means that it's, uh, it, um, it's challenging. It makes it a harder um, game plan, so to speak, whereas other farmers may not have the same kind of hindrances and barriers. Um, so I always try to uh, uh, include policy recommendations that specifically address um, limited resource and um, resource poor farmers um, in that small farm category or in that underserved small farm cut or that socially disadvantaged uh, category of farmers. Um, and uh, some of the coping mechanisms that small farmers use are to uh, one, rely heavily on on-farm uh, technology, you know, on, on what, it, what is it that, they, that can be done from the farm and used on the farm to, uh, to conserve energy, to uh, still grow the crops, to, to still advance production. For example, some of the strategies that farmers may use, like we're using, is uh, instead of uh, buying mulch or instead of uh, uh, purchasing pine straw or any other kind of um, uh, sometimes wood chips people use, you know, for mulch. So we're using and actually harvesting from our own 
woodland area. We're using pine, pine needles. And, and, and it's been really, really beneficial and um, a money saving opportunity, I have to tell you. And, it, uh, and what it does for us is that it also helps to control insect and pest uh, damage. I, I think that how we share information and how we see um, agroecology is important because um, uh, it's even more important now to emphasize strategies such as seed saving. It builds sustainability of the farms or uh, strategies such as um, uh, using mulches or making your own compost or um, using cover crops. Using cover crops is vastly beneficial for uh, uh, small farmers as well as large farmers and vastly beneficial for the, the local environment in general. So we try to emphasize strategies that uh, some may consider low tech, but very um, accessible and very um, uh, impactful, positively impactful on farms that can still enable the, the growth and uh, sustainability of the farm itself but also uh, increase production. Wonderful, very important. Thank you so much, um, mm -hmm. Dr. Taylor, for sharing. Uh, Janine, please. Oh, yeah. You're okay, here. you have me now? Yes. You can hear me. I keep hearing about seed saving. Uh, if things have been hybridized, I have heard that you're not able to save those seeds and then reproduce. I'd like a clarification on that. And also just a real quick one. We live up here north of Seattle, uh, not up in the foothills. I was composting and right in the middle of the garden, which didn't get produced this year because of multiple things, I had at least three or four plants grow. Wasn't sure what they were. I'd never seen them before. I ended up with 17 cantaloupe. We don't normally grow cantaloupe up here. The smallest one was about yay big. And the biggest one was about yay big, but they're very sweet. Great. Are three of the smaller ones. I don't know if you can see them or not, but the others are a little bit bigger. Now I took at least a dozen of them into church and told people I won't guarantee, but I had a couple of garden club friends say, I'm going to save the seeds because obviously they do reproduce from seed. Yeah. Okay. So my question was about hybrid and yeah. is there anything special about how to keep them just let them dry and put them outside in the shop or do they need to stay at a particular temperature or what? Okay, so seed saving is like the, one of the greatest tools in the toolkit for farmers, especially if you're an organic farmer or an agroecology farmer, but it has actually exists there for all farmers to use. So what, what we uh, teach is that, is to encourage farmers not to use GMO seed, are the GMO agricultural strategies, okay? And so uh, the issue becomes to use non-treated seed or heirloom seed, open pollinated seed. And you can choose to use hybrid varieties. Um, it's generally will separate, you know, after, after the, um, the plant grows and you'll have different varieties growing and you can select what you like from there. But, um, it, it is an active kind of participation kind of kind of event in seed saving. So when you select your fruit that you want to save from, you want to select for the, maybe you're selecting it for the color or the taste or the flavor, something about that fruit you like, the size of it, like you're mentioning, or maybe you like smaller ones, so you select for the smaller one, okay. <laughs> but generally the taste and the flavor and the color of the flesh is what generally what people go for. So you select that seed and uh, some people suggest from the cantaloupe, you're, you could just kind of take it all out. It's gonna, you're gonna have a million seeds in there. And then you can just kind of um, spread it out. And some people suggest 
rinsing it off. But at any rate, you want to dry it. You can dry it on a paper towel. You can dry it for a moment or so. And then you can also dry it on, um, on um, just lay it out in a tray. And then you want to keep it in a, in a dry, uh, uh, some people use it, use it in the back of the refrigerator, keep it in the back of the refrigerator. Others just keep it in a dry uh, container and a jar even. Thank you so morning. much, Dr. Taylor. I'm going to stop right there to see if we can share some quick updates right there, but everyone's welcome to stay to continue chatting with Dr. Taylor because I want to know how to do it well because I can never get it to work. Um, so <laughs> if you can join us later. So I'm just going to keep, uh, share some quick steps uh, with you all for a matter of time. Um, so we still have our voting pledge um, up and many states already open um, early voting season. So we do want to encourage folks to go um, in this couple of weeks uh, prior to election. Um, now that we have the time, try to encourage everyone to go to vote. And do uh, remember November 8, um, you can vote in person for some areas or you can bail, um, mail a ballot um, as well. Um, so keep that in mind, try to make a plan to um, vote and invite other friends as well to do though. You can reg uh, check if you're registered to vote um, as well online or calling um, your elections um, office locally. Um, we still do have um, our some of you mentioned what legislation can we support? Well, for right now, we have um, our uh, a campaign to prioritize climate justice legislation, and that would include things like the Farm Bill um, that, we, that um, Karen mentioned. So if you have a time, and Marion will be sending out that link, um, just it takes a couple of minutes um, or even seconds, and you fill up your information and you um, ask Congress uh, to prioritize just uh, investments in communities of color um, and BIPOC communities uh, that go towards climate justice. Uh, so thank you all for taking a minute to do so. Um, we have new postcards as well for our um, Breathe Again campaign. And so, as you know, we've been part of a collaboration work through US Can, and part of that has been working um, in uh, addressing um, air pollution, especially tackling on um, doing so by uh, promoting um, electric vehicles, for instance, in schools. Um, and so we have new um, campaign and try to ask Congress and governors to prioritize funding uh, for electric vehicles in schools. Um, just quickly uh, for work, uh, working group uh, on this webinar on, on justice in the nexus of food, agriculture and energy, we'll have a working group that Dr. Taylor so uh, kindly offered to um, facilitate for us. So uh, November 1st at 7 p.m. Eastern time, we'll cr be creating uh, some space uh, to go more in deep. Now that we've learned about some of the issues, now we can uh, take some time to actually see what we can do uh, in practice and take home as well in our on communities. And so uh, November 1st, we'll be doing that. And then the next monthly webinar uh, will be connected and on November 16th, we'll be connected to COP27 uh, and we'll be trying to bring the perspectives um, the global south and also gender constituency in the work uh, of cop and for those of you who are familiar there's a un climate change i mean yeah the un climate change conference that will be happening in egypt and will be participating so uh, for the second week uh, of, of the cop negotiations i'll be there uh, and we'll be sharing as well some programming around that as well as a um, prayer service toolkit and so do please um, Keep in mind that programming that we'll be sharing, and please do feel free to invite others to uh, get involved because we'll be sharing links so that you could be participating at COP as well uh, by taking out some of the streamed uh, resources and other uh, resources that will be provided alongside with that. So thank you all, and then we'll be sending as well a quick evaluation, and then um, I'll have Janine close us in prayer for the time being. Thank you, Janine. I am borrowing from Howard Thurman, his Center Your Spirits, which I found in our 2122 program resource, Healing and Joy on our journey to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, open upon us light for our darkness, courage, for our fear, hope for our despair, peace for our turmoil, joy for our sorrow, strength for our weakness, 
wisdom for our confusion. Forgiveness for our sins. Love for our hates. Yourself for ourselves. Lord, open unto us. There are so many opportunities to help. Guide us in what we do with what all is happening in the world, whether it's drought or floods or hurricanes or uh, wars that are going on and innocent people being killed. There's just so much destruction going on. We ask that thy will be done, Lord. Let us be your hands, your mouth, your eyes, your feet, your body. They help make a difference where we are and to help in any way that we can. Thank you for loving us and for showing us how to love. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that beautiful, beautiful prayer today. Mm -hmm. Dr. Thurman. Um, now, uh, well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us. We're so happy uh, to share this space with you. And thank you so much to our wonderful speakers for sharing uh, with us and for the powerful work that you're doing in your communities. Um, and if anyone had any extra questions or would like to chat, we'll leave it open for a little bit. Thank you everyone for joining us um, tonight. And feel free to ask questions and unmute yourselves if you wanted to keep chatting for a little bit. <laughs> but thank you everyone else for joining us. Yes, I, I'd i like to hear her finish how to preserve the seeds. <laughs> I do try to do that. And I don't know for how many years they're good, whether it's for flowers or whether for vegetables or even fruits or berries. Help. She's muted. Oh, Dr. Tell, I think you're muted. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I was just saying seeds are kind of tough, even though most people say one or two years. You, of course, the, um, the viability will decrease a little bit, but you can test them by um, when you're getting ready to plant. You can just wet them just a little bit between cloth, between a um, like a paper towel, just gently damp, uh, moisten it. And if the seed is viable, you'll see it start to grow. And you can take those and plant those. That way you know exactly what's going to, you know, if it's going to produce or not, if it has that intention in its heart to produce. <laughs> uh, so um, that is one way that you can test the seed to make sure, you know, after a prolonged period of time. But generally a year, two years is fine. And uh, of course, much longer. They're finding seed all the time, thousands of years old and still viable, you know? Yeah. It's wonderful. Thank you so much oh, for sharing. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting me be a part. Thank you. Very helpful. Very interesting. And thank you all for your leadership. Thank you, Janine. And thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Taylor, thank you, Karen. Thank you, Linda. Thank, thank you. you all. I appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate you all, too. Wonderful. Well, I hope I get to see you in the next one then. Have a blessed <laughs> afternoon. See you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.